Matt Roby. Thanks, Linda. Hey, everybody. So my name is Matt Roby. Uh, I'm with the business development team here at Dragos. So uh, I'd like to echo Linda's sentiment. Uh, thank you for joining us in the webinar today, uh, where, again, we're going to be exploring the real world implications of the MITRE attack framework. So to do that, we'll kind of discuss how the cybersecurity community can benefit from the framework in both their IT and OT environments uh, with an outline of what the framework is, uh, then jumping into how it can be leveraged to improve your mean time to response to cyber incidents, and then kind of finalizing with uh, why integrations uh, between your tools and your SOC uh, can simplify your workflow uh, with some demonstrations of using the platforms from both the Splunk and Drago's perspectives and kind of walking through uh, and talking about an attack scenario. Uh, so we've reserved some time at the end for Q&A. So uh, if we don't get to your question uh, uh, organically during the initial conversation, we'll get to them uh, holistically at the end. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Dragos is proud to present today's panel of Austin Scott, Douglas Brush, and Chris Duffy. Uh, we'll kick things off first uh, from introductions uh, with the panelists themselves. Good morning, everyone. My name is Austin Scott. I'm a Director of Detections at Dragos. Good day, everyone. I'm Chris Duffy. I'm part of uh, Splunk's uh, New Marcus teams focused around OT security and our offerings there. Hey, and this is Doug Brush. I'm a global uh, advisory CISO for Splunk, working with the organizations to build out their security programs on whatever technology they need. Awesome. Thanks, guys. So. Uh... What we'll start off with today first is a poll just to try to get a level set of how familiar you are with MITRE ATT&CK. So generally, uh, from three options here, uh, starting off with, uh, you know, you, you know, like the back of your hand, you may be leveraging the framework in your existing environments. Uh, you may be somewhat familiar with MITRE ATT&CK. Maybe you've seen some content online or have seen uh, generally the results of their evaluations. Uh, or you could be like me and you have to Google MITRE ATT&CK to make sure that you in, uh, are spelling it correctly every time you try to type it out. Uh, so we'll take about 30 seconds or so to see the uh, results. Uh, we'll review those and then jump into uh, the content for the day. Awesome. So uh, as to be expected, uh, the vast majority of you uh, are in the somewhat familiar category, which is great. Appreciate you guys for jumping on. Uh, surprisingly, uh, quite a few of you can't spell MITRE ATT&CK uh, just like uh, myself. So hopefully we can help fix that today. Uh, and then uh, also about 10% uh, or so uh, know it like the back of your hand. So that's fantastic. And hopefully uh, you can try to keep us honest today. Uh, so uh, we'll begin first with uh, Austin Scott uh, kind of jumping into what the MITRE ATT&CK framework is. All right, take it away, Austin. Thank you so much, Matt. Now, the um, MITRE ATT&CK framework has been around for a number of years, as, as we know, and as it's developed and matured, uh, and as the... Uh, analysts at MITRE have evaluated threats in the industry. They've uh, identified a number of categories that don't quite fit into the attack for enterprise framework. These are kind of the square peg round hole issues. Uh, and they've taken a waterfall approach to this. Uh, so as they ingest new threat activity into the matrix, they've, uh, they've set aside content over the years that don't quite fit in things for uh, the cloud or mobile or ICS have all kind of been set aside into these separate frameworks. Uh, and over the years, they continue to develop those frameworks in the background and compile this data. And then uh, in 2020, they released and launched the attack for ICS dedicated framework, which is really an encyclopedia of ICS threat behavior. It uh, documents all the publicly known uh, attack activity against ICS and really provides uh, an encyclopedia for ICS threat behaviors. Uh, and uh, each, um, each technique uh, and, and tactic uh, is aligned with uh, publicly documented uh, adversary techniques and adversary uh, activity uh, that has been collected over the years by uh, the MITRE team. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, and it really helps to highlight and shine a light into the unique threat behaviors 
leveraged by adversaries who are targeting these ICS environments, uh, which is important because as network defenders, uh, as well as adversaries, uh, they need to take a unique approach in ICS environments. They're very different from enterprise environments and uh, uh, they need to uh, change their behavior uh, in order to achieve their goals once they transition into these ICS networks. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the attack for ICS matrix and the attack for enterprise matrix, uh, they're kind of an eye chart. It's difficult to show the entire matrix in a single PowerPoint slide. So I've just cut off a section of it here, uh, the top left section of the attack for ICS matrix, uh, just to kind of show the structure of it. Uh, along the top, we have uh, the tactics. These are like the column headers we see here of collection, command and control, impair process control. And they really represent the adversaries technical goals, what, what they're ultimately trying to achieve. And it does loosely align with a, uh, a kill chain, right, from collection all the way to impact, like left to right. Uh, and under each tactic is uh, the techniques that are used to achieve these uh, technical goals. Um, and one of the biggest the challenges um, for network analysts is understanding their detection coverage uh, and uh, providing a single resource that covers all the publicly known ICS threat behavior has been a challenge. If you were to try to recreate this yourself, you'd need to go and collect all the publicly available ICS reports across the internet from multiple sources and try to compile them into this matrix. But fortunately, MITRE has done that for us. They've uh, done all the legwork to compile and map and uh, catalog all of this threat behavior uh, so that we can easily ingest it and navigate it. Uh, so it's really a terrific resource and, and something that uh, has been uh, missing in the industry uh, for a number of years. Next slide, please. Now, um, attack for ICS uh, exists because ICS environments require a unique approach. Uh, but there's always going to be some overlap between attack for enterprise and attack for ICS. So in this slide, I'll, I'll highlight that a little bit here, uh, because certainly ICS networks leverage IT technology uh, at the um, higher parts of the Purdue model, as we're looking at here, the, the level four, level five um, of the Purdue model. Uh, we, uh, we see those, those techniques and tactics are kind of repeated between these two frameworks. Uh, and there's a, about a 20% a overlap of techniques from attack for enterprise and attack for ICS. And the other 80% are very unique to ICS environments. So things like the initial access when an adversary first breaches a network, they're gonna be doing some of the same activities like persistence and privilege escalation and lateral movement that we see in the attack for enterprise network but this is really where the two diverge uh, because they're, they're working with, we're defending or an attacker is attacking uh, a process, a unique uh, process that's been engineered to solve a particular problem. It takes uh, more time and, and research for the adversary to really understand that network and understand what the goals of the process are. Uh, and ultimately uh, the goal of an adversary, as we've seen uh, in the past, uh, and even recently, as we've seen in some of the Iranian uh, activity group documents that have leaked, um, the attack for ICS matrix gives us a view of what these adversary playbooks really look like. So they're, they're trying to gain knowledge of the systems. They're trying to understand how they can use the systems to work against themselves, to cause a physical impact uh, and uh, uh, take the system down for as long as possible in, in most cases. So they're really trying to create a fire or explosion or or really uh, uh, impact uh, that facility in the worst way possible. Uh, and that's not something you can do with the Metasploit command or, 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 or a pre-built tool off the internet. You really need to understand the process, understand the, the vertical, understand the, uh, the environment you're in uh, in order to make that sort of level of impact. And same with network defenders. We need to understand the ICS environment that we're defending, the crown jewels, what, what, uh, what attackers might be targeting, where they might be pulling information to uh, gain these insights. And we need to defend those assets and prioritize those assets uh, so that uh, adversaries are unable to 
uh, get the information they need to create that physical impact in the process and um, uh, detect when adversaries are moving through that network. Next slide, please. So who uses attack for ICS? And there's a number of use cases that we can uh, talk through here. And it's not limited to these, of course, um, but uh, analysts uh, and across the entire board, attack for ICS provides that common nomenclature. It allows uh, different groups to have the same, uh, talk about the same topics and, and use the same language when they're discussing these threat groups or activities or incidents that have occurred in ICS. So uh, it, it can really cut down on confusion and reporting and discussion when we're uh, doing the analysis of these activities. Uh, it also helps with training and uh, OTSOC to help uh, understand what has happened in the past and uh, what these incidents look like or what a real ICS incident uh, can really uh, uh, look like and what that impact can be. IR and threat hunters, they can utilize this library of uh, enumerated threat behaviors as part of their ICS hunts or uh, within incident response, they can use that uh, to support their IR triage efforts. And when they're filling out the reports or, or doing the reporting section, uh, they can use that nomenclature and that common language uh, that ICS, attack for ICS provides. Uh, red teams can emulate the threat behavior of activity groups to help the blue team to better defend against informed ICS attackers or uh, adversaries that are focused in the ICS space. And it helps them to test and validate uh, blue team network defenses and, and uh, test their detection coverage within these ICS environments. And uh, ultimately the, the C-suite boiling all this up and providing sort of dashboards or, or coverage of these activities of the different techniques and tactics within the matrix is very uh, important as well. Uh, and we use it internally here to show what coverage of the different activity groups that we track uh, we have uh, in the ICS matrix across their different kill chains. Uh, and I'll kick it over to uh, Douglas here for the next section. And I lost my video. Ah, there we go. Um, yeah, and if we can just kick over to the next slide. It is. It's it's a hot topic right now. A lot of people are talking about this, a variety of different environments, and they really kind of can what Austin said. Um, it gives a lot of visibility. And ultimately, that's great. You know, in the end of the day, we need this common framework. We need these common languages so we all know what we're doing. Um, it provides repeatability in our processes. Uh, better staffing because our staffs are not wasting a lot of repeated cycles and they feel more confident in what they're doing. So ultimately it becomes this very uh, important thing that our tax dollars and it's really kind of a combination of tax dollars and public uh, public sector stuff that's really allowed the MITRE Corporation to come up with these various attack matrices and frameworks. But if you go to the next slide, Austin kind of keyed on it. It's, it's, I, the first blush when I look at this and again, my background has been in 30 years of technology, been done 500, 600, 700 maybe, hands-on IR investigations where I've led it in the weeds. But at the end of the day, I need to present findings to a board. And unfortunately, it's really hard at first blush when you look at this is to feel comfortable with it. And it made me feel a little bit intimidated when I first looked at it, even when I talked to other uh, folks and even some of the higher ups, even at Red Canary, they were like, this thing look confusing to you? I was like, I don't know what I'm even looking at at this point. It's, it's, I don't know how to explain this to the business. Um, and so really at the end of the day, if you flip to the next slide, the best way that I can really boil this down is really this. It's, you know, I wanna stop the bad things in my environment faster. And when I have a common language and a common framework, it allows that to be there. You know, one of the things that Austin was saying was you know, essentially you have playbooks. But it's not just the playbooks you're building for your incident response, your threat hunting, your triage. You're basically using attackers' playbooks that are out there, what they do in common attack behaviors when they're going after their goals and objectives to then find these patterns in the environment across multiple data sources, multiple environments sometimes, and, and multiple uh, accounts or just all this information that exists or you're able to correlate and look for these kind of threat behaviors. 
Um, so ultimately, that's what the real value of this all is. It's a common framework of playbooks that build repeatable processes that you can integrate into your operations and allow you to build better reporting and metrics that go up to the board that go, okay, we're doing a better job than we were yesterday. And here's how we can show it because we're stopping things faster. And we're stopping things in this area. We're learning from it and going to our lessons learned from our incident response process. We have now something that's going to enable our IR teams and others within our operations environments, ways to better handle events and determine, you know, sometimes when you're looking at an OT environment, is it down because it's a bad board or was it an attacker? You need to answer these questions quickly. And by having a common framework that allows you to tease out these scenarios really provides that value. Um, and as we just flip to the next slide, I don't know if this is where we're doing the poll, uh, Matt. Yeah. And so, yep. Basically, you know, what's your comfort level in the understanding of how to deploy the meta attack framework? And really, what I say is, what's your comfort level of integrating that I chart into your operations? I don't know if we want to hold us pulling from there. Oops, I opened, there we go. Interesting. So I would say, really, kind of the middle of the bell curve there, where where folks are, you know, really kind of feel comfortable they can really need help others. Um, <laughs> and with still a large majority of people not really able to even spell murder and how to deploy it, which is common. And you're okay. Like I said, my first, the only reason I know so much of this is just it's it's just repeated practices myself. And spending a lot of time with the five photos of Dragos and others where you know we just get to learn this stuff over and over again because it is complicated. So you shouldn't feel bad, but that's what we're here for is to help kind of shed some light on how to do it, uh, do it better. Because at the end of the day, if you flip to the next slide, you need to understand what's in it for you. You know, why are you trying to do this? So again, with the MITRE ATT&CK framework, it allows you to build repeatable processes and report metrics up to management and how well the program is mitigating threats. You can just take that tagline and start working that in your brain. You understand why you're doing something, then you can build a how. Because honestly, the average dwell time in attackers are in detect, you know, which is the time that an attacker is detected in the environment to the point of being remediated, is still very long in most enterprise environments. And Austin and Chris, I don't know if you have any numbers on the OT environments. I don't. Can you guys speak to that or what the dwell time is in those environments? Are they any better? Uh, much much longer in order to create an impact in these ICS environments the dwell time is is very very long understanding the underlying engineering uh, and uh, understanding the process like the Xeno time trisis incident we we tracked in the Middle East they were in that environment for years multiple years uh, before they were able to create that impact where they tried to bypass the safety system and destroy the plant which I think highlights another problem for for a lot of people is a lot of them, the, the visibility is can be almost non-existent. And so, you know, it's even longer because they may be going from, I've, I've never really done much in my environment to, you know, suddenly I can see a whole lot more. I have a lot more visibility and, and our findings have been similar that it's, it is often longer. And there's often things that people find that they weren't expecting. And it's because they're finally getting visibility. Yeah. And th those are scary things. And I've done, and when you start doing some of these mappings and sometimes you're doing security assessments, it's scary sometimes when the security, the proactive security assessment turns into an IR investigation when you find out some threats. Because ultimately what you're doing is you're looking for building out these correlated detection rules um, to give visibility. In which you know what's based these, when you base these correlation detection rules based on common behaviors, you can reduce the spread, the persistence, reduce the dwell time, and ultimately reduce the impact of damage an attacker could do. Um, because really at the end of the day, you know, if you're looking at an OT environment, you really need that availability, and availability equals money. And this is something that actually relates to the business, and it's a great intersection where the MITRE ATT&CK framework can translate operational threats and downtime into cold, hard cash, and that's the language business speaks. So it allows you to also be able to you know, frame things in your security program to get additional funding because you can start putting these metrics around about downtimes that the business understands. Because really, I, I don't know many business leaders that you know, really know or care about Splunk or Dragos or any new technology, you know, sorry to my sales and marketing people. Businesses just wanna know what happened, how long it'll be down, 
and what the potential losses are. And by using these frameworks and integrating in operations and using tools to enrich that and giving people that training to drive it, that would be repeat all processes. Ah, now you kind of see where this all starts pulling together because it's common language. We can mitigate the business risk by containing threats earlier because we know each step the action attackers will take to get to their goals. And I just want to touch on a brief example if you go to the next slide. In mid to late 2017, there was an attack on the Sondra Chemical Company. And it's a joint venture between Saudi Aramco and Dow Chemical, both of which have had their own sets of issues over the years. But this was kind of an interesting one. And from the New York Times article, a couple of things I've teased out that they said, you know, the attack was not designed to simply destroy data or shut down the plant. Investigators believe it was meant to sabotage the firm's operations and trigger an explosion. So while the objectives were really kind of damaging, um, it came through a cyber attack. So by using a cyber attack, there could be operational impacts in an ICS system, which can trigger a physical kinetic attack. attack. And so those were the motivations and objectives of the attackers in this one scenario. So as you build out your operations and you use the motivations and objectives to map out the behaviors, then you can build the detections around them, you know, provided you have the information from the OT and ICS environment. So garbage in, garbage out, you need that good data. But you'll think back to what the attackers can really do. I mean, this is, this is asymmetrical attacks and how attackers had a hard ROI on their behavior and to complete their objectives. You know, basically, they we're trying to blow up a plant from somewhere in the world, and really anybody could have been anywhere in the globe with relatively low physical efforts to carry out these goals. It's a bit of FUD on that or FUD, FUD uncertainty of doubt, but in your operational risk profile, this needs to be accounted for, even if it's just a black swan event. So you need to understand a lot of motivators and the respective behaviors. Again, where the MITRE attack framework provides this, it knows all this and you can start mapping this out. Is it perfect? Is it everything? No, but it's gonna give you a hell of a lot more if you're trying to build this yourself. Um, and so it's also important to note what else could occur in this scenario uh, from, from this particular attack is what we've seen in other operational supply chain attacks and IT management systems from a year ago, which is crazy to think that solar winds was almost a year ago is that this, these types of attacks can be done at scale. And again, from the article, United States government officials or allies and cybersecurity researchers worried that the culprits could replicate this attack in other countries since thousands of industrial plants all over the world rely on the same American engineered computing systems that were compromised. So it really quickly becomes this one to many attack profile. Again, this is where the MITRE attack framework is important because it allows us to build detection and playbooks at scale. Finally, from the article, what worries investigators and intelligence and analysts the most is that attackers compromised the Schneider's triconics controllers, which kept equipment operating safely by performing tasks like regulating voltage, pressures, and temperatures. These controllers are used in about 18,000 plants around the world, including nuclear and water treatments, oil and gas refineries, and chemical plants. Also, if attackers developed this attack technique against the Schneider equipment in Saudi uh, Arabia, they could very well deploy the same, deploy the same attack attacks here in the United States, which was uh, what, what insight from James Lewis, who's a cybersecurity expert at uh, strategic, for strategic and International Studies at uh, Washington Think Tank. So again, when you start putting this in perspective of outside the motivational of these attackers, yes, we know that, but also on availability, it goes back to that. If a controller goes down, if there's safety issues, can it be linked to a kinetic event that you know, causes damage you know, to the business? Was this a cyber attack or was this a failed uh, controller. How would you know this and how would you build out your incident response report or your incident, your, your business impact analysis ar around all this? Once you understand the how and why, you can start correlating these TTPs and events, operationalize detection, alerts, and faster respond to operation uh, in the operational security environments. So by using, again, their playbook to build your playbooks, you can respond faster and you have a better insight when these things happen of, hey, was this more of an availability thing? Are we seeing these types of behaviors that brought these things down that we're concerned there's a threat in the environment? Or did somebody in the IT environment you know, push out a firmware update and something's down? You wanna quickly be able to determine those because of the legal, financial, and regulatory risks that come into these. And really how fast you operate is what the business wants to know. These are the key metrics we look for in operations, whether it be in IT, ICS, IT, DevOps. When the proverbial shit hits the fan, how fast can we reduce the spray, stop it from continuing, clean up and move on? It's all the businesses wanna know. And by having this framework allows you to do these investigations quickly and at scale across the globe. And so we'll go on to the next slide. 
Austin talked about the kill chain model and how you can stop it. And really what you want to do in this model is, uh, and this is an example that it was kind of from the malware that was used in that last example, of the particular attack. Um, and so what you want to develop is this kill chain model that can help us stop the attackers early on. And so what you also get is this common language of information sharing, reporting, and operations, which can ultimately lead to further enrichment with threat intel and other data, as well as build repeatable processes that reduce your full-time employee needs. Because your end games and ops maturity is automation. However, you can't automate processes you don't have, and you can't build processes until you have a common language framework. And this is where minor attack again is important. So in this example, um, you know, yes, it's a Microsoft example, but drag us and spunk, we play nice, but they don't have awesome people like us presenting. Um, they we do have we have this kill chain um, in associated TTPs with the Trident malware which again was later classified and categorized as the, the Sidera chemical uh, company attack malware. So as you move from the far left, you can see how each tactic is mapped to a set of TTPs or technique. And we know how attackers will use, will use it to compromise an environment, get in, stay in, stay hidden, escalate privileges, grab other accounts, do internal recon mapping of the environment, compromise more assets while building out backdoors and ultimately getting to their goals. They don't do this for fun, they have objectives. And if you do note on the far left here that there's a number one, however, there's a zero, as in the zero day, is the initial compromise. And that actually happened in the IT environment. And this is where the attackers first get in, get credentials to the OT environment, then move over there. So they pivot off the IT environment, hit the OT environment. And you know, I think Austin could, uh, could attest this. This is probably pretty common. So as they jump from zero to one is where they hit the engineering workstation, the OT environment, they pivot from there on top of another pivot. And, continue to move through. <clears throat> so think about this, there are some far on the outside going through multiple devices, multiple associated environments, then getting to the OT environment. From there, they move laterally to two, hit the P, uh, PLCs, which allow them to turn off and uh, disable safety functions. Then they move to three, which they can shut things down by building in their back doors. And this can ultimately cause an, uh, cause an impact and loss of an estimate over $5 million. So as you see this, there's not a single technology that will stop this. You know, it's not like when we look at traditional AV and it has, um, you know, signature-based detections and alerting or other pivot single point tools that will catch these. And what they're doing is they're getting in what we call living off the land and they're getting in and using the IT environment, the systems, the credentials to stay persistent. The longer they're in there, the wider they spread. So you want to stop them as early on because then you reduce the risk. Because the longer the attacker's in the environment, the further they get in, the harder they are to get to contain and eradicate, and the greater risk for reputational, financial, and legal damages. And this is the stuff that CISOs and boards lose their jobs over the longer these things are in their environment. So by stopping them, it also benefits the business by killing them early in the environment and stopping the damage and uh, risks. And with that, I'll turn over to the next, uh, the next slide, the speaker. I'll just jump in uh, uh, and add to your point, Doug. Um, it's uh, really important to focus on threat behavior within the ICS environment, because as uh, Doug mentioned, the, the adversaries will gain control of the uh, engineering assets and will attempt to use them against the process. So it, it can be very difficult to distinguish that from normal engineering operations when someone's making PLC changes uh, or safety system changes. How can you tell that's not a normal operator? Uh, you have to look for the context. You have to look for the threat behaviors uh, that led up to that impact, led up to that uh, change that could could look like a normal change if you just looked at that in isolation. Uh, so there's no there's no um, I, uh, IOCs. There's no atomic detections uh, for some kind of exploit against. Uh, well, there are for for exploits against PLCs. But if you're using the engineering workstation to modify the logic of a PLC, uh, there's it's difficult to create those. Uh, those indicators of compromise. You have to really look at the behavior around the event, around when they made changes to the process control system and, uh, and use that context to determine if it's a threat or a normal engineering operation. Yeah, and I think that equates pretty well to a lot of the IT environments. You know, Was this a mistake or was this an attacker? Did somebody use credentials um, that were compromised, or was this an admin that was, you know, responding to an IT ticket at 3 a.m. and was just too foggy? And the, I mean, we've seen these so many times. Is determining the, the the known good and the known bad is is 
based on behaviors, not one single thing. So it's a very important to tie the tactics together when you see a, some kind of technique that looks like engineering workstation compromise or masquerading and, and remote system discovery. You need to, to tie these together uh, along the kill chain um, and not isolate them individually. Like um, you need to create sort of a compound composite uh, detection or composite uh, analytic that allows you to uh, identify the progression of the adversary through the network uh, before they make their final uh, impact or make those final changes. Like I don't so. know, this sounds too hard. Is, is there a way to do this and operationalize it in my security operations environment? <laughs> Thanks for that tee up, Doug. That's uh, <laughs> uh, almost felt staged. So uh, what we'll do here is kind of uh, position into the, the final section of our presentation of you know why integrations can help simplify your SOC workflow. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll have uh, Chris Duffy take over uh, and kind of present uh, the Splunk platform itself uh, and kind of walk through a scenario. Take it away, Chris. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna jump into uh, a little different. We're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna cover several things. So I'm gonna cover one about the integration between Dragos and Splunk and how that works within the SOC. Uh, and so we'll we'll step through a few things. Uh, you'll see some of the like rich thread intel and and things that the Dragos platform is performing or uh, providing to Splunk. And then we'll also look at a little bit of how that also surfaces within uh, the, the Dragos Threat Intelligence app. And so what we're going to do is um, I'm, I'm going to start with Splunk's OT security add-on. Uh, so this is a, a, a free module for our customers who are using enterprise security to begin to integrate uh, OT data and particular use cases and products. And so we're going to start at a very high level, we're gonna start at a, a security posture. So specifically for my OT environment. Um, now, obviously I could break this down, you know, between different sites. In this case, I happen to know I have Dragos deployed at this facility. I can see some, you know, high level KPIs, but then I can actually see the notables that are being generated. Now these are gonna be notables that are generated by Dragos, by Splunk. It'll be, you know, combined for that particular facility. But for this particular one, we're going to focus on specifically on the Dragos alert. So I'm just going to filter down to the, the alerts that we're getting from the Dragos platform. And what we can see is, sure enough, we, we have some, some notable, some alerts that we've gotten. All of them are related actually to this PLC one. And so maybe I want to see, understand a little bit more about this incident. And so the way I would do that would be just to drill down in this. Uh, I'm going to look at, I'm going to pick this WannaCry one in particular um, so that we can uh, drill down in particular on that one. And so we see, okay, here's, here's all the incidents I've had of this particular incident. Uh, and this is more kind of a traditional SOC, uh, SOC, what they would be used to using. And so I can see these incidents. I can see the criticality. I can also see, for example, the MITRE technique but I can also expand this so I can see more information about it. So sure enough, this is coming from the Dragos platform. I see the information on this TTP. So it's lateral movement, exploiting remote services. But what we've also done is we've integrated a lot of that uh, information about the asset and stuff that uh, Dragos perform, or provides. So not only do I see the detection, but I see, you know what, here's the IP, here's the risk associated with it. Here's the business unit, how it's categorized. You know, we see that's a PLC, uh, as well as all this other rich contextual information that you need to understand from responding to OT context. It's obviously very different responding to something going on a, a PLC or a safety system versus uh, an email server. Both need to be remedied, but you know, how you might handle that might be a little bit different. And so what I wanna do is I, I wanna pivot from here. I wanna see, are there any other um, things I might want to look at regarding this asset? Because I'm just looking at one particular notable. Maybe I want to understand more about that asset. And so we'll do that just by clicking on this arrow and going to our OT asset investigator. And so that's going to take us here. So here's that particular asset. Now, the thing to understand is even though I'm using an IP, it also knows that that's PLC1. It also knows the MAC address if it had a DNS name we know all that information together and how they're kind of associated. I can also see information like vulnerabilities. 
So for example, if I drill down on this, I can actually see um, the vulnerability that's been detected. Um, and so um, it's one of those areas, for example, if I drill down, we can see here's that specific asset, here's the specific vulnerability that's been reported by Dragos into it. But I can also look beyond some of these high level items. I can also look at other data sources. So uh, maybe looking at how risk has changed over time or the network traffic. Things like, you know, show me the, the particular subnets this device is communicating from the data. And that's one of the difference. I'm not relying on a static diagram. This is actually generated from the activity uh, we see. Now, maybe I wanna do other things. I might wanna, for instance, understand how is this traffic getting here? So by double clicking that, that will take me to my traffic investigator dashboard. And so what we can see here is we can see our perimeter devices and how they're actually communicating, in this case, inbound with this particular PLC and, and what means. Now I could also look at it from a, also a network devices, router switches as well. But in this case, we're just focusing on, okay, how, how are these hosts communicating uh, should it be allowed? Should it not? Obviously, this can provide a big visual cue. The other thing that you may want to do um, is um, use what's called risk-based alerting. So there's a lot of alerts or, or information you might get that isn't particularly actionable. So maybe it's something like a communication error. So you need a little bit of, again, that threat intel uh, and, and context around it. And so what you can do as well is you can say, you know what, I, I only want to be notified about this particular problem if certain conditions occur. So, and they recur, for example, repeatedly. And so um, in this case, this is a communication error and we've just said it, this is the particular object associated with it. Again, I could drill down and see those various items and I can see, you know, I had 42 events for it. You know, again, that may be an operational issue, maybe a security issue, but it allows you to kind of provide that analytics on top of what you're getting to start making it less noisy. Uh, for example, we, we had a situation where uh, there would be some, some Triton alerts and uh, the platform generated a lot of Triton alerts, but it was, it was nine plus alerts as opposed to maybe taking some of that information, distill it down to here's one notable for this particular incident, and here's all the related activity. And so it's it's about taking all that rich contextual information, but even with, as we're talking about with the MITRE, there is some context that needs to be put around this, whether it's from the asset level or um, what's happening in the environment. Now you can also use the Dragos Threat Intelligence app uh, to get a lot of that, this information. So in this case, this is, this is information coming in I can see in this case, I'm looking for indicators. I can see there's 20, 27 indicators. I can see how they can, are broken down. I can actually see, you know, here's here's the actual events. And I can, just like in the other um, instant review, I can also, again, do some, do some uh, expansion on these to look more information. Or maybe I wanna pivot and look at it. You know, I'm, I wanna look more on the behavior side. I wanna look at threat behavior. And so I can just go over to this tab and again, I can see that. And so for example, in this case, there's some threat behavior related to communication issues and loss of control on, uh, I happen to know that this is on an engineering workstation. And so um, communication between engineering workstation and a, and a device. And so again, all these are gonna provide rich context around what's happening. Uh, we, we do see a lot of um, customers looking at integrating their IT and OT. And MITRE is going to, in many ways, is kind of that the MITRE attack is going to be their common language. And so there's a lot of values, especially as you look to combine teams and, and, and build different socks. And so with that, I'll, I'll, I'll actually uh, pass the time back over to Austin. Let me uh, stop sharing here. Thanks so much, Chris. And oh, we lost our slides. There we go. Uh, so the other option you have, when I was um, working for a, a US utility, uh, we had a similar kind of setup. We had uh, Splunk 
for our event reporting, um, which the SOC was monitoring 24 seven. And I was kind of the OT uh, SOC guy when there was an OT alert that popped up from their ICS monitoring, I would uh, investigate. Uh, and uh, I would typically jump into the, the tool um, that was detecting these and do some analysis, look for related activity or, uh, or other, other things. So that's what the Dragos platform can provide. Um, if you wanted to dive into the investigation a little bit further, you can uh, kind of see how the assets are related and what the communications look like through the uh, asset uh, inventory or the map that we have, or you can even replay uh, the events through our timeline. You can, you can pause and, and play and see the network activity through the network uh, in a visual manner. Uh, and you can um, uh, see how these detections are mapped to the MITRE framework as well. And that provides some context as to the stage of the kill chain the adversary might be working in. Uh, and often the adversaries are just trying to build that capability. They may not want to make an immediate impact. They, they just want to be able to uh, hit that button uh, if the need arises. Uh, and as, a, uh, as an analyst, you can kind of manage that investigation with some uh, workbenches and playbooks. One of the problems I had at the previous company I was at was when these detections came in, like, what, what do I do? How do I triage them? How do I investigate further? And um, the Dragos platform does provide these playbooks that kind of give you step-by-step -step guides into your investigation, what you need to do next, uh, and uh, how to kind of dive in more with some of the, the focused queries that we have in the platform. Uh, and uh, uh, some of the other detections you may want to look into around the incident. Next slide. All right, it's Q&A time. We've had yeah, some so great that, we'll, we'll, we'll take it to Q&A. So I know there's uh, been a few uh, questions organically in the Q&A section and also through chat and uh, we appreciate that. Um, I guess at, at this point, I'd recommend uh, Austin and, and Douglas and Chris, we'll try to uh, collectively take these. So uh, one that uh, I guess most recently noticed um, how do threat actors map and what threat actors map to the framework? So maybe Austin, uh, you can take that one. And then uh, Douglas, you can uh, add some Splunk context. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, the, uh, within the attack for ICS matrix, several of the activity groups that Dragos tracks are directly listed in there. And there's a number uh, that are not directly linked or listed that we track ourselves, we map ourselves in our own sort of internal version of the attack for ICS matrix. Uh, and there are, I mean, it is a collaboration of um, information across the industry. So a lot of the activity groups in the uh, attack for ICS matrix have multiple names, depending on what the um, research organization that was diving into the material uh, uh, was using at the time. But you can sort of see uh, as part of that common nomenclature, there is a, a an adversary uh, filter. So you can click on the adversaries that are referenced in each technique. And then you can see the other names uh, that are, are assigned to that same activity group. So um, it does provide that, uh, that mapping of these different activity groups, which can be very confusing. That's another great feature of the attack for ICS and an attack for enterprise framework. Yeah, I think that's important to note too. Is that you know it's it's interesting for me culturally to look at these, uh, the way that we almost kind of forget when you've been doing incident response for long enough that what what an APT group is, how they're named is. You, know, you start finding that these are businesses. I mean, these, these are they have clear objectives. Uh, they train together. They use a lot of the same tooling. There's repeated patterns in the way that they train each other. And so what you start finding is with these particular groups, where they are geographically is they start doing a lot of the same behaviors. And so why, when you say a TTP, it's, it's a known threat of threat actors behavior, when you say threat actors plural, it's because these groups tend to use a lot of the same processes and steps. Um, you know, whether they go through the, the, the kill chain from point A to point B might be the same, how they do it becomes different. And seeing how they do it um, allows you to then know better within, thing, uh, within the kill chain where you start looking for things and where you can get early detection. Again, 
earlier you can detect these things, and once you know you're a target for these types of threat actors, um, the better you can build out the risk profile that aligns with your business. So you're not looking for everything at all times. You're looking for specific things that are impact your business um, and get the appropriate funding to support those kind of um, operationalized risk management. Thank uh, Doug. Um... It's very difficult to retrain once you've learned uh, these techniques and once once that has been uh, taught yep. to a, a team to get them to change those behaviors can be difficult. So that's why uh, the attack for ICS and attack uh, enterprise matrix helps us to kind of focus on the behavior rather than the atomic indicators or or uh, or hashes or IPs. All that infrastructure can change so easily, but trying to change that behavior of how you move through a network or or how you escalate privilege uh, or uh, or uh, make modification to a PLC that requires a lot more investment. So it's uh, it gives you a lot more longevity in your analytics and detections if you focus on that threat behavior or look for that threat behavior rather than the atomic indicators. All right, so uh, next one that I'm, I'm seeing really quickly we can address is just uh, how can the MITRE ATT&CK framework be used for tabletop exercises? So again, let's uh, maybe start with uh, Doug here and then position back to Austin. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's it's if you're looking through a tabletop of, you know, whatever the scenario is going to be, um, it's important to then map those behaviors, uh, particularly when you're going to start looking for things around containment eradication, um, and as you move to recovery, because, you know, you you want to know what else is out there, and so when you start knowing the again the threat profiles that might be out there, you might particularly uh, pick a particular attack group or a set of TTPs, um, and you start looking along that throughout your um, incident response planning. That's where you're going to have to start looking for areas that have to close off holes and continue the containment um, process, because I think that's one of the hardest things that I've found in the years of doing this. Is you, know, you think you get uh, you think you get them contained, and then whoops, they pop up over here. You know, there's some rogue malware spins up over here, and then you're playing whack-a-mole, uh, which is the worst kind of area you want to be in. So by having these kind of known set of behaviors, and it does give you some mapping to certain things that you want to look to con to contain. So if you know, hey, like um, you know, they're, they're going they're going to go after this asset next, or they're looking to spread here where they are in the kill chain. I know what steps I have to take to start isolating things for containment. Austin, anything else you'd want to add to that? Yeah, certainly it can make uh, planning a tabletop exercise a lot easier, especially if you're targeting a specific adversary or activity group. You can just sort of filter the matrix by that group uh, or just look at the threat behavior. Uh, for example, the attack for ICS um, evaluation, they they created a really great Xeno time scenario. It wasn't a tabletop, it was a full-blown scenario, but uh, they leveraged their material right out of the matrix, right out of the attack for ICS uh, content to uh, recreate that um, that attack. And they put a little spin on it as well. They, they, they changed it uh, slightly uh, to make it more interesting or, or uh, make it more applicable to the environment that they were creating. Uh, but it, it, can, it can certainly um, make it easier for you to develop your tabletop exercises uh, based on past events. So I'm seeing a question. Uh, so given the open nature of the framework, is there a published set of SOC playbooks out there? So uh, I can imagine all of us fretting over the uh, matrices and spending a lot of time writing playbooks. So uh, Austin, how about you take that one? I, uh, that's a great question. And that would be a wonderful community resource, but I'm not aware of any, um, uh, any SOC playbooks. And it's, it's really tricky to, um, uh, to, to create something uh, for the ICS environment because uh, often they're, they're very unique. Uh, they're, they're engineered to solve a particular problem. Uh, and um, you, you know, even when multiple companies have factories that, that create the same product, the network infrastructure, the, the technologies used can be very different from factory to factory. So that one playbook for one factory may not fit another one. So it, uh, those those playbooks may need to be fit for purpose uh, for uh, those environments. But there's certainly some things you can you can look into, uh, and and um, there are uh, data points you can pull on based on the behaviors you're seeing in the attack for ICS matrix. And there are some recommendations in that matrix on uh, on uh, how to better defend 
against these each individual technique. Yeah, the, the, the only thing I was going to add is um, there, there's not a broad um, available yeah, framework out there. I, I agree. Um, there, there are things, though, as Austin mentioned, where um, there might be existing playbooks around some of the mitigations and things like that. So for each of the um, each of these items, they'll, they'll have a list of recommended mitigations. And so having a tool that not only can detect it, but then, you know, okay, let's validate all these mitigations. There is some capabilities there, uh, but it's not like uh, a completely open, you know, this is how you do it. It's, uh, we, we fully expect customers to have to customize that some to their particulars of their environment. I saw another question uh, pop in there. Uh, has Dragos published a collection management framework that maps data sources from techniques to potential detection tools. Uh, we have published uh, a CMF, um, but I, I don't think today it's mapped to the attack for ICS matrix, uh, but we do have a collection management framework that, uh, that we've published uh, a white paper on that a few years ago uh, on um, how to get better visibility uh, and uh, sort of manage your IR responses within uh, ICS environments. I think a, a quick, a couple that we can answer. I uh, saw a question around what's the relationship between Splunk and the Dragos platform. Uh, uh, simply, uh, we are uh, two tools that uh, your SOC can use. And what we're trying to do today is trying to elaborate on some of the integrations that are helpful uh, in potentially uh, improving the, uh, the data streams between our, our two platforms. Uh, there was another question specifically around, uh, you know, where we can learn more on how to implement uh, these integrations. Uh, so as a follow-up from this webinar, we'll send some links out to our uh, generalized content. Uh, there are apps available on the Splunk uh, store itself. Uh, there are free apps uh, with uh, the, the two different platforms. And then also, I'd also recommend uh, contacting your uh, Dragos and, and Splunk sales teams. Um, Doug or Chris, anything else you guys would want to add to that? Yeah, and I think it's important to note too, you know, I saw some questions about, you know, the OT environments in general. You know, when you look at OT and ICS environments, they are tend to be very delicate and can be. Um, and they're different than IT environments and form and function support, and particularly when you have to do incident response. I've done my fair share of OT um, environment security assessments and was alarmed early on when I started like almost 10 years ago that holy crap you guys have stuck next running here and like oh my god this is an incident but like yawn yeah we knew about it we, we turned off the beaconing but I was like well can we shut it down and remove it but like can't take that system down I'm like what no that's that's a business critical system if that goes down that costs us money so we've isolated the threat we've allowing it to run but it's not touching anything and quite frankly we mitigated to the rest the risk to the acceptable level but if we take it down, that has a larger business impact. And I was like, wow, that's, yeah, I didn't put it in this context. So understanding the business objectives of the OT environments and how you respond to them uh, becomes very important, I think. And that goes to what the technology does. You know, Splunk is just a platform. We just ingest data, but the data has to come from somewhere. So, you know, traditional, let's say IT environments where I get Windows event logs, I get endpoint information, proc, whatever it is, um, and correlate that, that's very easy. Uh, and, and, and known kind of um, field mapping. Now with OT environments, that data is not quite the same. Um, and it's important to understand this is a specialized subset of uh, folks at Dragos that look at this this type of technology, build out, okay, what's the field map? I mean, everything about them is just different. And having that ability of somebody pull out, normalize and provide us that data so we can build better correlated rules and, uh, for events and alerts is so critical. So that's where the, the partnership really comes in is, they're, they're getting us data that we can then uh, visualize and operationalize within uh, SIM, but without that data, it's, it's very difficult. And that, that's why we love working with Dragos on it. Yeah, and, and the only thing I was gonna add is, is kind of highlighting what Doug said is, um, we, I see a lot of people out there who think there's gonna be one tool that solves everything. And there's not, just, just like on IT, there's, there's lots and lots of tools uh, to solve different problems. You're going to have the same thing on the OT side. You're, you're, you're not going to have one platform that solves all your problems. Now, obviously, you want to get the best coverage and the best tools, but it, it's more realistic to understand that this is going to be an approach of, of a, a group of technologies to get the visibility and protection that you need.
So, so Matt, I, I see a question here. There, there's a question uh, I'll just answer real quick. Is there a specific version of Splunk for ICS? So uh, it's the same technology. So it's the same in IT and OT, it's the same platform. However, there is what's called the OT security add-on for Splunk, uh, which, which is an app, but it, it also includes a few other pieces as well, which is um, it, it's, it's a free add-on to be used with enterprise security. And it is focused around um, OT detections as well as integrations with with uh, partners like Dragos is a, is a big part of it as well. So see Austin's also addressing a couple of questions uh, uh, via chat. So just to kind of summarize, um, with industrial control systems and in OT environments. Uh, there are many uh, tools, including the Dragos platform for kind of uh, passive asset discovery and then uh, vulnerability uh, detections and then uh, event monitoring associated with those devices. Um, it, if you have any questions on, on how that works, uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, I don't know if there's any other questions you guys want to try to address into that we're coming up at the top of the hour. Um, but what I'd like to say is uh, thank you all for uh, for joining us today. Um, again, if there's any questions for the, the Dragos or Splunk teams, uh, we will be uh, you know, available uh, via our sales teams afterwards or uh, through uh, kind of our contact pages. Um, again, we appreciate your time and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day.